Yeah, we'll just give it like three to four minutes. Okay. All right, so um, we can go ahead and get started. I'm just gonna start posting the questions in the chat. But um, so hello everyone, this is Dr. Darsh Shah and he's a PMNR. And um, he will be doing a Q&A session with us today and make sure to stay till the end and go ahead and ask your questions in the chat and I'll be um, sending them to Dr. Darsh Shah so he can start talking to you guys. And um, towards the end of the session, we will send out a Google form so that you can um, get your shadowing hours. So make sure to look out for that. All righty. All right, what's up everyone? Um, I know you guys are all through YouTube, so I can't really see you guys, but um, I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you guys, my medical message for having me. Um, part one was awesome. Hope you guys got some value out of that. And uh, this is pretty much just gonna be kind of extra credit on top of part one here, kind of just doing a Q and A. Again, my name is Darsh, um, better known as Dr. Darsh on social media. Um, if I don't get to your question on here, or you have a personal question, feel free to message me on Instagram. I reply to everybody. So I'll be more than happy to help you there. But essentially about me, so um, uh, like you said, I'm an intern, so I'm a first year uh, resident at Penn State Hershey, completing a four year residency in physical medicine and rehab. Uh, and I will be staying at Hershey for those three extra years as well. Um, my main focus afterwards, as of now, is to do musculoskeletal regenerative medicine, along with integrative and functional medicine. And I can definitely get into those details uh, if, there, if there's some questions about that. But um, I always start off and I, I always tell the audience, um, you know, I kind of have three goals here. 
One is to really convince you guys to go into medicine. Uh, the second one would be to convince you guys not to go into medicine. And then the third one is to make sure you guys are really in that gray area and you have no idea, but that's where all the growing and learning and thinking happens to make sure that you are making the right decision for your career and so that you can end up becoming the best physician that you can be. Um, so let's get started here. So I'm, I'll, I'll go ahead and start looking at some questions. So what made you go into this specialty of medicine? Uh, and do you believe you can establish strong physician patient relationships through your work? I wanted to ask, what is this difference in the bread and butter of inpatient and outpatient? What led you to this specialty? What is the difference between physical medicine rehab um, as a specialty and physiatrist? Are they different? All right, so let's just kind of delve into what PM and R is, right? Physical medicine and rehab. So two kind of components, physical medicine and the rehab. I always start with the rehab because I think it's the easiest to understand because you guys know what it is. If you guys have ever watched TV and seen commercials of like a wounded soldier, um, having an amputation, kind of they show a film of like a hospital physical therapy room and the soldiers work, work, working on walking on parallel bars. That's essentially like the typical patient that we would see. Um, and what we would do as a physiatrist or physical medicine and rehab doctor is medically manage those patients. So we look at the inpatient side of things on PM&R, things like spinal cord injury, brain injury, stroke rehab, general rehab. So a lot of these injuries people don't ask for, you know, a lot of times they get in a car accident, motorcycle accidents, gunshots, et cetera. And they're unable to walk or they're now urinary incontinent. They can't control their urine. Uh, maybe they have some nerve problem, maybe some muscle issues where they can't, um, you know, use certain muscles. So it's a team-based approach. Us as the doctors are kind of the generals on the field. We look at everything from a holistic view and say, what do we need to do to functionally optimize this person so that when they go back home, they can get at least as close as possible to how they were before their injury. So it's a team-based approach. We work with physical therapists. Physical therapists are you know, the one-on-one -on -one with the patient, getting them through balance exercise, strength exercises, uh, awareness, all those things. Then you have occupational therapists. Their job is to make sure that the patient can be functional with daily tasks, how to use a fork, how to get into a car, how to get into the shower tub. And then we have speech therapists, right? So a lot of people come in with strokes and they lose the ability to talk and they lose the ability to swallow. So speech therapists will help with that. And then of course we also have social work, right? So what if somebody lives on the second floor uh, or like a second floor apartment? How do they walk up the stairs if they're unable to walk in the hospital? Um, what if they live in the house and, there's, and, and they need a ramp or a wheelchair? So that's where social work really gets involved. So that's kind of the inpatient side of things. Now, when we talk about the outpatient, that's kind of more the physical medicine aspect. Uh, you know, so physical medicine really deals with the musculoskeletal system. So your muscles, your joints, um, as well as the nervous system superficially. So things like peripheral nerves, helping your muscles move, all that kind of stuff. So when you look at the outpatient side of PM&R, uh, you can see it on a spectrum. And there's kind of sports medicine, there's pain medicine, and then in between something called interventional spine, um, where you do injections to like low back pain, burn nerves, um, things of that nature. And then there's pm and is so super specialized. You can go into cancer rehab, you can go to movement disorders, you can do pediatrics. You can be just a doctor who's really specialized in the, in the shoulder or something. Um, and the beauty of the field is that you can really take all these moving parts or whatever you're really interested in, combine them and kind of create your own specialty out of it or become a master of whatever specialty you're gonna call that. So for me, I wanna do musculoskeletal regenerative medicine. So using a lot of ultrasound um, and and using, the, using your own body's components to allow yourself to heal. So something called like PRP, where you take the patient's, their own blood, you spin it down, you get the platelets, and platelets have a lot of growth factors, they have a lot of nutrients, and then you inject it back, let's say, into their knee if they have osteoarthritis. And over time, those growth factors and stuff will hopefully help to build more cartilage and create that inflammation and get the knee back working. So that's kind of a, you know, a short little synopsis on what PM&R is. And if you're talking about, you know, physician uh, patient relationship, that's exactly why I went into this field is um, I think you're working with the best patients, right? You're working with motivated patients. Like I said, a lot of these patients don't ask for their injuries. And so they're super motivated. They want to get back. They're on this journey of a roller coaster, right? There's so many ups where that one day will be great. And the next day they're down and they can't control some functions. And then the next day they're up. And I have that ability to kind of hold their hand and walk through a whole month or two months of trying to get them back to where they were. Um, and I just think that's, that's something special. And that's, that's honestly why I chose the field of physical medicine rehab. 
Um, is cancer treatment rehabilitation included in your training? And have you had any patients who have had cancer treatment? Is it important for you to maximize patient independence and in activities of daily living? Yeah, absolutely. So to answer your last part, yes, absolutely, right? That is what our focus is, is to improve the functionality, to optimize their daily living and daily activities. Cancer rehab is, is, is a newer field, maybe in the last like five to 10 years, and now it's really starting to come up. So more and more programs are starting to add training to it. There's not so many fellowship opportunities yet. Maybe, I, don't, I actually don't know, but I would say maybe around eight to 10 fellowship programs around the nation um, for cancer rehab. But yes, it is something that you'll definitely see. I'm not in physical medicine yet. I'm an intern. So I'm kind of doing my internal medicine residency, my prelim year as my first year. And then starting next year, I'll really get into the thick of things with PM&R. Um, but I do have like a hematology oncology two week rotation this year where I will be dealing with cancer patients. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll at least try to be thinking um, how to rehab these patients. And again, this is where it can get really cool because as a cancer rehab doctor, you can go inpatient and just do cancer rehab inpatient work on prehab is what we call it, right? Because a lot of these people get chemo and chemo can make you weak. So how do we get you strong enough so before you get to chemo, it won't affect you as badly? You can also just become a, you know, a lymphedema doctor or patients who just have breast cancer and mastitis and you just work with that. So there's so many different things that you can do. Uh, where do you feel like PM&R is most underutilized? Uh, what do you wish everyone knew about the PM&R specialty? Can you further specialize within PM&R? As a PM&R physician also practice occupational medicine. So yeah, I think I kind of covered that, right? Like you can definitely specialize in a bunch of different things. Um, I think it's underutilized as a whole in healthcare. Um, you know, PM&R is not something that you're really taught in med school. Um, that's why a lot of, a lot of PM&R doctors don't get into it until their third or fourth year of med school, where one, they either heard about it from someone else, two, they got lucky and stumbled upon it because somebody told them or they didn't elect it, or three, they actually knew about it in high school or college, beginning of medical school and pursued it. So it's not really that common of a field, but yeah, definitely underutilized. A lot of our patients in the hospital, um, you know, even with heart failure or COPD, they get debilitated they end up staying in a hospital bed for so long or they go home and they just lay in bed. And what happens, you weaken your muscles, you're not as active. And so that's why I'm really into integrative and functional medicine because functional medicine is root cause analysis. So here in like the Western healthcare system, we often just treat the symptom, right? Somebody comes up with heart failure, we diurese them, we give them Lasix, they pee out all their fluid, we get their shortness of breath better, and then we send them home. Well, what happens? They come back in two, three months with another exacerbation, right? No one's treating the underlying issue as to why do they have heart failure. And that's why I think functional medicine is so important. And I think it goes hand in hand with physical medicine rehab. because It's all about optimization, optimizing lifestyle. Uh, what made you decide um, to become a DO rather than an MD? Uh, do you primarily work in a hospital setting or a private practice? Uh, how would your day-to-day -day responsibilities change depending on the setting? That's a good question. So I only got into BCom Virginia, DO school. So that's why I went. And all honestly, I was waiting for a school in Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from, which was an MD school. And I got waitlisted. If I got in there, I probably would have went there because it was closer to home. I also got into the Caribbean school, St. George's. But again, you would always take a US school over a Caribbean school. Looking back, I'm so grateful that I'm an osteopathic doctor because I utilize OMM so much. I use it on friends, I use it on family, I use it on my patients whenever I can. And for me, going to physical medicine and rehab, being able to use these, super important. So I can, so what osteopathic manipulative medicine is, right, OMM, is what DOs get trained on that MDs don't. So we do 250 plus hours of OMM where we learn to treat and diagnose with our hands. So I can crack backs, I can like work on the skull, uh, I can crack necks. I can do like chiropractor kind of like massages. I can get your lymph moving. So there's different um, modes that, you know, I can really use uh, depending on the patient. So, you know, I'm super grateful that I ended, I had to end up going DO. So, um, and then the next thing was, uh, do I work primarily in hospital or private practice? So obviously during your training, it's going to be more hospital until you get to like your third and fourth year PM&R where you get a lot more outpatient exposure. 75% of physiatrists go into private practice, 25% stay in the inpatient realm. So spinal cord, brain injury, stroke. Um, so that's that. And then how would your day-to-day -day responsibilities change? So in the hospital setting, 
you're, you have a set number of patients, right? Usually like you're, you're capped at a certain number. So let's say that number is like 14. So you have anywhere from like 10 to 14 patients and you're just going to see those every day. And then you're going to get admissions. So hospital is a little bit more of an acute setting, right? You're taking care of patients in that moment. Whereas private practice, while you do get your fair share of, of acute patients, you're also taking care of follow-up. So people who just come to see you every three months or every year. Um, also that outpatient lifestyle is going to be like a nine to five usually. Um, and you'll be seeing patients every 15 or 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Whereas when you look at the inpatient side, it's a variable time, right? Like it, it's usually like seven or eight to like six or something, um, depending on the day and if you're on call and whatnot. Um, how did you get exposed to PM&R in med school since it's not a core rotation? Do you use OMM in your practice? Where do you think the future of the specialty is heading? Treatment technology, do you work a lot in pain management or pain medicine? Wow, it's okay. Yeah, wow, you guys really, really did your research here. I like it. Um, so how did I get exposed to PM&R? Very good question. So my first love, this was in my third year of med school. My first love was GI. I thought I wanted to do GI. I thought the microbiome, you know, is popping off. I, again, it's really related to functional medicine. I just love the idea that you can do procedures and whatnot. The only thing was I don't like internal medicine because again, you're just treating symptoms. So typically when you're a med student and you work with residents, they'll always ask you, Hey, what are you thinking of going into? What are you thinking of going into? So I was on my first rotation and it was ob gyn and the ob gyn residents like, Hey, Josh, what are you thinking of going into? I said, you know, thinking like GI, I'm really into like alternative medicine, functional medicine. He's like, well, if you're into that, why haven't you like, why aren't you doing PM and R? And I thought to myself, I was like, why am I not doing PM and R? Like, you know, I did shadow it once when I was in college and I had a really bad experience because I was just with a speech therapist and like, it wasn't, it wasn't what PM and R truly is. So I looked more into it and I said, this makes a lot more sense for what I want to do, especially someone like me who's grown up as an athlete, you know, out of the nine uh, intel intelligences that we have, musculoskeletal is probably the, the, the biggest one that I have. So understanding like the physics of the human body, weightlifting, all that stuff. So I'm really interested in that. And that's exactly what PMR delves into. So I looked into it. I did one, I did my elective rotation as a third year in PMNR. So I did two weeks inpatient, two weeks outpatient. So I got really good exposure. And I thought after that, I was like, yeah, this is it. This is what I want to do for sure. Um, but you're right. So PMNR is not a core elective uh, unless you go to some schools such as um, New Jersey Medical School, uh, Rutgers, they have their core rotation as PMNR because their program is so good. Um, so there are some schools that do it, not many, probably very few, like probably you can count them in two hands and that's it. Um, but where do I think the field is going? It's popping off. That's why it's such a hot field right now. Um, it's the most competitive field in terms of number of applicants to spots. Um, and the reason for that is because, again, you can literally create any field you want out of it. You're not pigeonholed into anything. You've taken out so many of like different experiences and doing what you want with it. And then you look at artificial intelligence, you're looking at robotics and looking at prosthetics and how that will interplay. It's it's only going up and up right now. And then you look at orthobiologics, right? So looking at things like I was talking about, regenerative medicine, where you're looking at how can we heal the body from within, stem cells, fat cells, PRP, all these different crazy modes where there's so much research going on. So it's, it's, it's gonna get big and it's gonna get even bigger in the next 10, 20 years. Uh, how is physical therapy different from PM&R? <coughs> Excuse me. So again, physical therapy just works on the patient in terms of strength, balance, like musculoskeletally, that's it. They're not doing any medical management, right? They're not looking at what are their blood pressure medications? Do they have diabetes? What are their comorbidities? What if this happens? How do we take care of that, right? Like what if this person gets a stroke right now? How do we do a code? So those are things that, you know, as a physiatrist, you're still gonna be the doctor, right? That has to take care of that patient. Will you be doing further fellowship? Yes, regenerative medicine as of now. Um, what way to go in PMR? How did you prepare for PMNR? So the, the body organization of PMNR called AAPMNR, American Association of Physical Medicine and Rehab, if you go on their website, it is awesome. I think they're the one of the, the or they're probably the best organization to help out like medical students, residents, fellows. They have like a step-by-step -step guide in terms of like how to get into the field, what books you should read, um, who to contact, how to get a mentor. There's just, it's such a great field because the, the, the networking opportunities are like limitless because it's such a small field. So I would definitely check out that website if you're interested. 
Uh, what is a con about this specialty? That's a good question. I really can't think of one besides like, it's just not known, I guess. Um, you know, you can definitely get overshadowed by like orthopedics or you can get shadowed, but overshadowed by like neurosurgery or something um, or neurology. Maybe, you know, that's the only downside I could think. But again, more and more people are starting to understand what PM&R is now. What is the most common injury you see? Probably low back pain. Uh, as a PM&R resident, are there any other specialties you interact with? Yeah, absolutely. You, are, you interact with every other specialty, but for the most part, orthopedic surgery and neurosurgery, because you know those patients are always going to have spinal cord injuries or brain injuries, and then they come to you for rehab. But when you're on consults, like you go to the hospital, um, you, it can be any type of patient. So it can be anyone, urology, internal medicine, pulmonology, it can be anyone. Do you treat CRPS? Yes. Complex regional pain syndrome, that is. Um, trying to look here. Are PM&Rs PM usually on call? Not really, um, unless, again, you go, like, inpatient realm. And um, during residency, I mean, you will be on call. It depends on the program itself. Um, luckily, here at Hershey, it's home call, or it's how, uh, home call. So I can be at home and be on call, and if I get called in, then I go in. Whereas some programs, you have to be in the hospital, and that's house call. Um, in your specialty, do you work along with physician assistants? Yeah, you can. So when I did my um, 30 year rotation, uh, the, the PAs were actually doing the injections, whereas the doctors were taking care of like more of the cerebral kind of uh, patients where you really had to think things through. Okay, we talked about the cancer rehab. Is it important for you to maximize patient independence and activities? Okay, I think I answered that, so yes. Okay, where do you think the future of this specialty is heading? Science that. Uh, what all did you do in undergrad years that really helped you in medical school? Wow. I'm gonna tell you, honestly, not much. I probably should have done more. Um, the number one thing I had was shadowing. I had really good shadowing experience. So um, I was at UPMC for a lot of my shadowing. I lived the resident lifestyle. I was waking up at 4 a.m., coming back at like 9 p.m. Um, on EMT surgery orthopedic surgery, uh, did a little bit of PM&R, psychiatry, and emergency medicine. And, you know, in one week, I already got like 90 hours, 100 hours. Um, so it was cool, like, to get that experience. Um, and then the other things I did undergrad, well, you know, I, I was part of a fraternity. I was part of a dance team. Um, you know, I wish I had more leadership experience. I wish I joined more clubs to actually climb up the ladder and make an impact. And I didn't realize that until late. And, um, you know, that's the one thing if I could go back, I would do. I was actually in a seven year med program uh, at Temple University, so a BSMD program. Unfortunately, but fortunately, um, I missed the GPA cutoff by 0 0.02. And so I was forced to take two gap years because I couldn't get in my first application cycle. Didn't get it. I got waitlisted in my second application cycle. And then finally, that third application cycle, I got in from VCOM, who waitlisted me that cycle before. So you know, it wasn't really what I did in undergrad. It was what I did during my gap years. And so during my gap years, I did three things. First thing I did was pediatric emergency medicine scribe at a uh, CHOP. So, you know, I was a scribe for Scribe America. Did that for about nine months. Great experience. I, re I really recommend everyone to kind of do a scribe position if they can, because you're really going to see how medicine works in terms of interaction. How do nurses interact with doctors? How do the techs interact with doctors? How do doctors interact with patients? How do doctors use the EMR system? How do they become efficient? What takes them so long? Where does the burnout come from? Right, you're gonna have an insight into that if you do a hospital setting. Private practice is definitely a little bit different. But then the other additional you know, benefit of doing a scribe is learning how to type really quickly and learning how the EMR works and just learning how to navigate things. You know, EMRs can be different, right? You have like Epic, Ibex, Cerner, but they all operate kind of the same way. And so when you get into medical school and you do your standardized patients, you're gonna easily just crush those because you're, you're, you're gonna know the flow of things. And then when you get into residency, you're not gonna be so like afraid of the EMR and getting used to it. So there are definitely benefits for that. Anyways, I digress. I did that for nine months and then I did paid employment where I worked as a virology lab technician at a pharmaceutical outsourcing company. So essentially I was culturing cells, looking at viruses, seeing if there were like any cytopathic effects on these medications. Um, so, was, you know, I just did that for about nine months as well, quit the company cause it was just very 
malignant. Um, but it was a great experience because you know, like how much, how many pre-meds get that paid employment experience where you're working at a legit job, you have to like dress up to go in, you have to say good morning to people, you have to ha understand how to work with a boss, right? Like that's not something as pre-meds we're usually used to, right? Because we're just thinking about going straight to medical school and then residency is the first time you kind of go through that. But it was nice having that experience and just being like, you know, learning social etiquette a little bit more. Um, and I think that really helped me grow. And then after that, I looked at my application. I said, all right, where am I going wrong? What else could I use? So I did research in undergrad. It wasn't like the best research. And I eventually got published like probably three years after I graduated. But I said, all right, if I don't get into med school this time around, I don't know if I want to retake my MCAT. Maybe I'll do like a master's or a PhD in like exercise physiology. So I said, let me try to get exercise physiology research. Because it'll also, you know, it was, it was a win-win. It, it will also look good on my medical school application for that application the third time. So I cold emailed about 50 people from like Baltimore all the way up to, um, or from DC all the way to Boston. And finally heard back from um, one professor at UPenn and she's like, all right, call me. So I called her. She said, okay, great. Why don't you come in and we'll like see if you're a good fit. Ended up being a good fit. And I did this all for free. So I did free internship, like volunteer research for nine months, drove every day to Philly, um, like 40 minutes out and um, ended up being one of the best experiences I've had because they asked me to do an abstract. And if I wanted to, wanted to do my own study, I had no idea how to do that. But the one thing I learned is if you get asked to do an opportunity like that, you say yes, and then you figure it out after. Um, so I said, yes, I ended up figuring it out. I ended up presenting at a conference and then ending up getting recognition from my PI and asked me to stand up in front of like 300 people because of what I was doing. So that small recognition can go a long way because the next thing you know, my PI who was at UPenn leaves UPenn and ends up going to Hershey, which is where I am now. So I don't, I'm, I'm sure she played a big difference in me coming here, um, you know, telling the program um, directors and everything, uh, my work ethic and kind of what I did and whatnot. So, you know, the biggest, biggest lesson from that is just, you know, being persistent, um, being courageous, just say yes to opportunities and figuring it out later and just keeping with it because things will come back full circle and you'll definitely, you'll definitely see that eventually, but it just takes time. So don't quit. Everything will come back full circle. Okay. Um, do you do procedures in PM and R? Yeah, you do a bunch, right? So like physical medicine, musculoskeletal nervous system. So there's something called EMGs, which you have to get trained and get a certain number of hours. It's to really see like which nerves are damaged. You'll do, if you do interventional spine or pain medicine or sports medicine, you'll be doing a bunch of injections. Um, yeah. So you can also do Botox injections. There's a, there's a whole plethora of things uh, for, for procedures. What is the efficacy of OMM in addressing musculoskeletal pain? I don't, I haven't looked at the research. I know there are some articles though that do show like counter strain and myofascial release. Some of these methods do work. But OMM is also very subjective and a lot of it can be placebo as well. Um, but the most important thing is if, you're, if your patients are getting relief from it and they're also not on like chronic pain medications because of it and their compliance has increased in terms of seeing you, that's what matters. Very general question, but what was the most difficult part of medical school? Um, yeah, so this kind of gets related to the part one of my medical message where I kind of talked about, you know, staying on your own path and not really comparing yourself with anyone. I think in medical school, it's very, very tough to not play, to not play somebody else's game, right? Like you've got to stick to yours. Um, especially when like boards are around the corner and you hear people saying, oh, I'm going to apply for derm. I'm going to apply for neurosurgery. And you're just like, man, like these people must be crushing it if they think that. Everyone's, everyone's talking out of their butt, right? Like you just got to stick to your own path and you know, everyone's like, oh, I got an A on this exam, an A on this exam. And I was from day one, I knew GPA did not matter in med school. Um, and it's funny because two years down the road, people are like, man, I, you know, I don't know why I tried so hard in this class or this class. And I was like, exactly like, you know, I took, I, I, I would sacrifice an A any day in order for me to live my life outside of medicine. Because the last thing I wanted was for me to go insane just in the books. Um, and so I had a really good like work-life balance, you know, uh, through med school. And I, I swear to God, I tell everyone this, med school, I think is easier than undergrad because one, you're not chasing anything. You're not chasing grades. You're not chasing shadowing hours. Like the hardest part of the whole process is getting into medical school. Once you're in medical school, so many people 
get through it, right? So you're, you're just gonna be another one of those people who are gonna get through it. So you should have that confidence right when you get in and uh, just really focus on the type of doctor you wanna be more than just looking at a person who can get A's or you know great scores. Because in the end, that's not really gonna differentiate you as a physician, so. Um, is research important getting into pulmonary residency? Not necessarily. It's not a research heavy field, you know, whereas you look at like ENT or plastics or um, ortho, where the more competitive specialty, you're really looking at like, what do you know about this? Be like opto, you need eye research or something. PMNR is getting more and more competitive, like I said. Um, so having it doesn't hurt, of course, right? Having it lets programs know, hey, this person is very passionate about PMNR. I didn't have it in med school, but I did do cancer rehab research, which is the research I did at Penn. Um, so it kind of helped, you know, having that research, but it's not necessary, but it does help. Where's the best way to get opportunities as an undergraduate student? So it depends on what opportunities you're looking at, right? But like, take for example, like AMSA, right? Or AED, these like medical school clubs. You just join them, try to get like secretary or treasurer or whatever, like your first year or social chair, and then keep applying up and up the ladder until, you know, whatever it is that you want to make an impact. Even if it's a smaller club, it doesn't have to be a big club. There's literally... Three important things I always say that when you're looking at, when you're looking to get leadership. One, what is the impact you can make, right? Like what is it that you wanna do? Two, what is the impact that you're making on yourself, right? And then three, what are you learning from this? How, what are the implications of this? How is this gonna make you better, right? So two of them are very acute, right? Like what's the impact I'm gonna make if I'm president of AMSA? How do I wanna change this? What impact is it making on me as a leader right now? And then three, how is that going to make me a better leader in the future as a doctor? So when you come to your medical school applications, that's kind of what I tell my students to really focus on, because that's what they care about. Everyone knows what AMSA is, right? A program director or a, you know, a med school ad com knows what it is. You don't really have to explain that. But what you can explain is what you did in that club, right? Because that's going to be different than every other president of AMSA or, you know, whatever leadership you're looking into. Um, do you ever feel that life passes you by really fast after you get into medical school? What is the best way to enjoy your time in medical school? And I guess not. Yeah. I mean, it, time flies, right? You're, you're, you're busy in the books. You're busy doing your thing. Um, those four years are going to fly by. I'm already a little more than 25% done intern year. And I feel like I still know nothing, you know, so time does fly. Um, what's important is you prioritizing the life you want to live, right? So that's why I love gap years, because in those gap years, you can figure, really figure out what are those things you love? What are those things you want to keep with for the rest of your life? And for me, daily, that's meditation, that's reading, that's working out. It's also just learning something new or just always building something, like creating a side hustle. And right now I have a podcast launching in uh, January. So those are the things that I made sure to do in med school on top of my um, study. Or you know what? Rather, I should reword that. I did my studying on top of those things. So I always made sure that I lived out my lifestyle first, right? So if I didn't go to class or I had mandatory class after that, I'd get my workout in, I'd make sure I had a healthy diet, I made sure I read 10 pages a day, I made sure I did all these things. Then I went to study, right? Because if I flipped that, if I did studying first, my willpower would all be gone, right? I'd be like, I'm done, I did what I needed to for today. I don't really care about working out or whatever. But if you save studying for the end, you can't get through med school if you don't study. So essentially, you know you have to do it, even if it takes you to 1 a.m. or 12 a.m., but at least you're going to keep your side hustles and passions and hobbies, right? And that's the best way to not get burnt out and live your life. Because at the end of the day, you're going to look back and be like, damn, I accomplished everything I wanted to. I got my studying done for that exam coming next week. But I also every day am doing these things and I'm seeing progress in the gym. I'm seeing muscle. Wow, I finished this book. Wow, my mind is so clear, right? So you really got to figure that out um, and make sure that you're doing those things. What advice would you give yourself if you could talk, uh, where to go, if you could talk to yourself, I'm guessing, oh, from five years ago. So five years ago, I was 23, I'd be going into med school. Okay, let's, let's back it up. Let's, let's give my advice if I were a freshman in college. Number one, I would not have done a BSMD program. Um, because I think it limits you in terms of the major that you can be. So I don't know if this is true for all BSMDs or BSDOs, but for me at Temple University, 
I had to be a bio major, biochem, or a chemistry major. And there is absolutely, I believe, like zero value in being a science major for med school. Like nothing honestly translates over. You know, biochem, maybe this much. Physiology, maybe this much. Like you're going to relearn it again in much more depth at a faster pace. So you might as well enjoy your major in college, right? How many of us actually enjoy bio majors, right? For you freshmen and sophomores listening, how many of you guys are actually loving bio 101? Like not many, unless it's your true passion. Sure, go for it, right? But what if you realize, hey, medicine's not for me. Is there, there's not so much value a biology degree holds. You might as well do those things that you're super interested in. If it's computer science or business or world history or philosophy or you know whatever it is. So if I could go back, I would have been a business major and done econ. Sure, I would have minored in bio because you need those prereq courses, but at least, you know, now as a physician, there's so much more utility as a business major than there was as a bio major. I at least could learn personal finance and accounting and taking care of my bills and all these things or entrepreneurship versus bio, which is absolutely nothing, right? Like absolutely nothing besides nothing, giving me my quote, my my prereqs. So that is definitely the one thing that, you know, I would urge you guys to do if, if you're in high school or you still have an option to switch your major, um, switch it unless you're super passionate about what it is, but do something you're passionate about. You have four years of your life, right? You're, we, we just talked about how do you not let life pass by? That's one way. Do something you're interested about. It's four years of your life where you can really just delve into something that you never will ever have a chance to again. You're going to be doing science for the rest of your life. You're going to be doing medicine until you're 70, 75, right? every single day that ish gets old. So definitely do something um, where you're super passionate about. Uh, what is the role of spasticity clinics? Yeah, so a lot of patients get spasticity, right? So I don't know if you guys have seen my presentation that I've done, uh, case presentation on PMNR, where you know I talk about this girl who came in with spasticity. So a lot of times when we see brain injury, patients get spasticity, right? So they'll be like this, or they'll be down like that and they'll have trouble moving certain aspects, right? Because their muscle gets so tight. So spasticity clinics, what they do is essentially how do we make somebody more functional? Doesn't necessarily mean that we always weaken that muscle so the spasticity is gone, but how do we make them functional? Some ways you can do that is Botox, right? Because Botox relaxes muscles. Um, other ways you can do that are, you know, orthotic devices. So something like a brace that can help you help that muscle stretch out. And then they can at least use like, you know, some device to help them eat or whatever. So huge role in spasticity. Also another field in PM&R that's on the up and up. A lot of fellowships coming out for it. If you want to do pain management fellowship, uh, can you get through PM&R? Uh, yeah, you can. So pain is usually anesthesia and PM&R. There's more anesthesia, anesthesia fellowships than PM&R right now, but some of the programs hold spots for PM&R uh, candidates. And, uh, as they should, because what we do is pain, right? Like we are the pain doctors, um, you know, more so than anesthesia at times. So yeah, you can definitely do that. Uh, if you do take a gap year before medical school, should you be doing research and work or is it okay to just focus on travel and take a step back? Both, I would recommend both. I traveled, I did backpacking trip, I ran with the bulls, it was awesome. Um, I was a Lyft driver for fun and I got to meet cool people. Um, I was, you know, doing research and those three things that I, that I said. Um, so yeah, do a combination of both. I do think it's important to work on your application and to kind of just be consistent because again, you need to figure out if medicine's right for you during those gap years, right? You need to have some life experiences that can at least help you for when you become a resident or a physician or in med school. And those life experiences are not only through travel and stuff, even though they are, I 100% agree, you should travel, you should enjoy your twenties before life passes you by. 20s are your golden years. Trust me, there's so much fun. Um, there's so much growth. And then, uh, so while you're relaxing and doing all those things, I do recommend, you don't have to go super hard, like getting all these shadowing hours in every day, but definitely just figure yourself out. Figure, hey, do I like psychiatry? Do I like uh, ENT? What are some things I can do? What, is, there, is there something I want to build on the side? So it's really a time for you to just grow, whatever and however that is. Uh, I see here, if not PM&R, what field would you want to go to? So my backup was family medicine. 
because again, looking at functional medicine, uh, root cause analysis, family medicine is the best transition to that. Dealing with patients with diabetes, heart failure, COPD, 90% of diseases, 95% of diseases in the US are chronic, right? They're chronic diseases. So how do we treat chronic diseases? Chronically, right? And I think that's the issue with the Western healthcare system is patients go to the hospital, we treat acutely, they go home. You got to treat chronic with chronic. What is the hardest part of PM&R? I mean, you know, I'm not a PM&R resident yet, but I think the hardest part will be kind of just learning a new language and a new medicine, right? Because like we don't get much exposure to it in medical school. So going in and just kind of like relearning everything as a baby almost, right? Like everything. So I think that that's kind of tough. But again, it, it's your passion. It's something that comes on quick. Um, but I would say I think that's the hardest part. How do you prepare yourself for the sheer volume of material you have to learn in med school? Yeah, so, you know, med school material is not hard. It's the volume that makes it tough. What I did is I, I can't procrastinate. Um, so I literally scheduled out, I reverse engineered all my study, all my uh, lectures that I would have to study based on the exam date. So let's say I have an exam coming up November 10th, right? 10 lectures. So then November 9th, I would write in my calendar, study lectures one to 10, right? It's a full review of that day. Then November 8th would be two lectures, study lectures nine and 10. November 7th would be study lectures seven and eight, right? And then you go back five, six. Well, and I, I would do that for every single exam. I would reverse engineer. So every day I would only have to study maybe six lectures max, right? Two, two and two, three different classes or however it works out. But that kept me sane. That kept me not freaking out. Um, you know, there were times you definitely have to cram because it, there's just so much volume, but you get over it. And again, I'm not focused on getting A's. I'm focused on learning the material and enjoying my life. And as long as I can do that, I reach my goals. You know, there are some professors and some exams that they're just hard as hell. Like the questions are like, this is ridiculous. I don't know it. Like, so there's some things you just can't do, but you know, I really focus on board studying from day one. Um, cause I knew that's what mattered in the end, right? My board score mattered more than my GPA. So that's kind of what I focused on, right? It's, it's about knowing the one thing that really matters every day. Uh, and then what subspecialties within PM&R are considered most interesting? So I think most students going into PM&R are really into the outpatient world. So like sports medicine or interventional spine, uh, spine, interventional spine or pain medicine. You'll have some folks that are really interested in like spinal cord injury or brain injury but most of it's outpatient. What's the best way to get clinical research as an undergrad student? Is there a certain way that we can contact doctors that you would recommend? How do we find contacts? Yeah. So step one is how do you find contacts, right? So I would go onto either a hospital near you or your undergrad and look for professors doing research, right? Just make an Excel, Google sheet or whatever and write it all out what they do, what department, their number, their email, and a short description of what they do and how many publications do they have, right? If they only have one publication, what are the chances of you getting published, right? And that, that should be a goal, right? It's not the overall goal, but it should be a goal. Versus you're looking at a professor with like 30 publications in the last two years, you're probably gonna get published. You're probably doing very important research. So then now what comes next is how do you email these people? So I think you always have to keep the email short, right? I see too many people write, I'm, you know, Dr. Darshan Shah, and I'm an undergraduate at this, 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 my interests are in this, and I saw what you were doing, and I'm very interested in this because of I did this. It's too much, right? That's what they get all the time. Keep it short, keep why you want to do it. I'm very interested in what you have to do. My goals are to one, understand the scientific process, two, get more involved in clinical research because of the implications of this as I go to medical school, and three, whatever, learn scientific writing. Right. Just keep it short to that. And then at the end, if you want to include, I'm this, 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 please let me know. Fine. If they don't respond to you, respond back. Hey, I'm following up on the above. If they don't respond to you, respond back. Hi, I'm following up again. Uh, let me know at your earliest convenience. Perseverance and constant email show dedication, right? So a lot of people feel really weird and awkward if they're like, I don't want to reach out to this professor again. Well, what's the harm? If they didn't reach out to you the first time, one, don't assume. Maybe they forgot. Two, maybe they looked at it and they don't have room and they didn't get back to you. So you might as well respond again. If they don't have room, they'll tell you they don't have room. If they do, then you do. But like, what's the worst thing that could happen, right? And if they say, hey, sorry, I don't have room or there's no availability, ask them, do you have any colleagues that have open labs? 
right? So it's all about leveraging and networking. Um, so that's what I recommend doing. And you have to do it a bunch of times. You have to email 10, 15, 20 people. Like I said, I emailed 50 researchers from, you know, DC to Boston. So yeah, I had to research, I had to look at hospitals, I had to, you know, go through all this stuff. It's really not hard. Once you get started, it's very easy, but that's kind of the best way to go about it, uh, in my opinion. Would a PM&R physician treat vaginismus? They could. Um, so you could, there, there are pelvic floor doctors out there um, for PM&R. Um, so, I mean, you definitely can. Like I said, PM&R, it, it runs the whole gamut. Whatever you can think of, you can create it and make it a musculoskeletal kind of way. Uh, is sports medicine fellowship also available as an option? Yeah, so it is. So here's what's interesting. Sports medicine is easier to get into as through family medicine because there's more family medicine fellowships. Sports medicine is the most competitive fellowship in PM&R because there are just not many fellowship programs, but you get better trained in sports medicine as PM&R over family medicine, right? And that makes sense. That's essentially what we're doing. So I will always value training over the ease of getting into something, um, but that's just what it is. Can we say the curriculum is orthopedic surgery minus the invasive part? Not uh, kind of for the musculoskeletal portion, but then you're learning a whole nervous system portion as well, right? Brachial plexus, the nerves, how it all works. So it's kind of like orthopedics. And a lot of orthopedics actually apply to PM&R as a backup, but they're also different. How much exposure will you get to different subspecialties during your residency? Uh, a good amount. You know, if the program offers it, then you'll do it. But your, your first year PM&R is typically like all inpatient. And the second is kind of half and half inpatient, outpatient. And then your last one is like, consult, outpatient, pediatric. So, and then you really can choose your electives. This year, I'm only going to have two weeks of consults in PM&R. So I'm actually going to be an internal medicine doctor seeing PM&R patients. So it's kind of like flipped. So that's the only thing here in Hershey, if you do a prelim year, uh, you don't get much exposure into PM&R. You've got, you just wait till the next year when I go there. Do you recommend doing a post back? So I kind of have a general breakdown where if your GPA is lying from like a 3.45 to like a 3.7, I would say you probably don't have to do a post back. I mean, you could, let's say 3.5 or above and you can't get into medical school. I would just focus on your gap years and doing solid work, right? Looking at your application, seeing what do you need to fix, getting better experience, showing grit, right? Like if you're an ad comp and you look at somebody applying, and you think of how would they be a great medical student? Well, what is medical school, right? It's a roller coaster journey. You're going to fail exams. You're going to do very well. You're going to get depressed. You're going to feel on top of the world, right? It's just this. So what if you had this and an experience like that before going to med school, right? Now that ADCOM can look at your application and be like, oh, wow, Darsh has already like gone through some ish, right? And like understands that there's going to be some downtimes and resiliency and going up and this experience, this scribing experience where he had these encounters um, really shaped his character and stuff. Wow. He'd be a great fit. So that's the way I would kind of look at it, you know, um, in terms of those gap years, if you are below like a three, four, I think a post back would be helpful um, because at that point, the GPA is just such a limiting factor. And I would look for a post back with linkage because at that point, you just want to guarantee, you want to go to a program where you meet the GPA requirement, you meet the MCAT requirement, boom, you're in, right? I don't think it's worth the money to get another degree and then apply all over again. You know, I don't, I don't know how much your chances would go up. But if you're looking to do, let's say like research later on, then it might be worth it to do like a master's in clinical research and then, you know, apply to medical school. Because now, once you're a physician after residency, that master's in clinical research will hold a lot of weight. And now you can do a lot more research because of it. What sort of things attract you to certain residency programs? So it really depends. For me, it's about how not malignant are they, right? How is the culture? Does everyone get along? Is program leadership great? Do they listen to feedback? Are they always trying to improve? Um, are you able to kind of shape your own destiny in that program? Are you able to navigate and kind of do what you want to do? Um, location is huge, cost of living, right? Like external factors. How far are you away from family? 
Um, so there's, there, there's a bunch that goes into um, picking like a residency program or, you know, ranking it. So yeah, there's a lot, but those are kind of the main things you look at. And then also looking at like fellowship opportunities, how, where are the current residents matching? Do a bunch of them go into fellowships? Do they not go into fellowship? Is there a specific type of fellowship? So all those things kind of matter. Uh, are you stuck where you get your residency? Not, I mean, yeah, for the most part, you could transfer if there's like an open spot or something. But for the most part, I mean, for PM and R, you're kind of stuck because again, we filled up 100% of spots like every year. Um, yeah, for PM and R, uh, so it depends in terms of prelim year. So you always have to do an intern year, right? But there's things called, there's categorical programs and there's advanced programs. Categorical means you're doing all four years at that program, right? So let's say like Pittsburgh, for example, UPMC, they have a categorical program. In that first year, you're, you're, you're going to be doing a good amount of PM and R. You might be doing two, three months of PM and R. So it's built in to that PM and R program. The other is advanced where let's say, so Hershey's advanced, but it gets a little complicated because I matched here as well for my intern year. So let's say Jefferson in Philadelphia, right? They're, they're, they're an advanced program. So my first year intern year will not be at Jefferson. It'll be at another place where I just do one year of preliminary either surgery or internal medicine or a transitional year. And then I go to Jefferson those next three years. So there's categorical all four years together. And then there's advanced where there's one and then three. Did you ever consider getting a PhD? Absolutely not. I don't think they're worth it unless, again, you're very, 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 very into research. Like you would want to do, a PhD would be worth it if you want to do research like 95% of the time and then 5% see like patients and stuff. If you're really interested in research, I think a better option is just getting a master's in clinical research. So my cousin did, and he's exploding in the research field right now as an ENT. Um, so I don't think there's a lot of weight to having a PhD, especially if you're trying to be a clinician. Um, Cause you can still do research as a physician. There's nothing that limits you, right? And you're gonna be sought out for, for a lot of these trials. So I never thought of getting a PhD unless I wasn't doing medicine altogether. Uh, surgical intern year versus I am intern year. Uh, what gets you the better training? Most people I've talked to have said the I am intern year, the prelim, because those are mainly the patients you're going to be see, seeing in PM and R, right? Like learning uh, urinary stuff, incontinence, um, movements, uh, COPD, asthma, diabetes, these chronic conditions that people come in, come in with. That's what you deal with as a internal medicine doctor, right? Surgery can definitely help you with like wound care, um, some of that urinary stuff, lesions. Um, so there is value for surgery. I just think there's more value for internal medicine prelim year. What's the work-life balance scenario at pm &R? How important is step three? So, you know, the joke is, well, there's kind of two. So medicine's best kept secret is pm &R, people say. Um, and then pm &R, the joke is that it stands for plenty of money and relaxation. So that kind of answers it. But no, in, in all seriousness, um, it, it is a great lifestyle if you want to make it one. It can also be very demanding if you make it one. The beauty of PM&R is there's so much flexibility. Again, you're not pigeonholed into one thing. You don't have to be on call if you don't want to. Um, you know, it's not like those other specialties where if you do this, then you have to do on call and this or work in a hospital or whatever. So there's a lot of flexibility. Um, step three, from what I've heard, not really in the PM&R world, step three is kind of just a formality where the governing body just takes your money for no reason. Um, so, you know, it's just a way to make medical students go broke again, um, or residents at that point, you know, you can't catch a break. So, um, it's really not much value. I've heard there's more value in internal medicine. Like if you're applying for like a competitive specialty, like GI or cardio, but even then I've heard some people say like, eh, it doesn't really matter, but I've heard people say it might. So PM and R not from what I've heard, doesn't matter. So, or from what I've heard, it doesn't matter. Uh, have you considered starting a private practice in the future? What are the perks and drawbacks? Yeah, that's a great question. I had, I have thought about private practice because if you want to do functional medicine, you could work at a wellness center, but sometimes it's just easier having your own private practice where you can do regenerative medicine and functional and IV therapies and supplements and all this stuff. Drawback is once you open your practice, you can't move, right? You're kind of stuck in one place. So like 
you know, what if I want to move to Cali? You know, I'm from Philly, but me and my wife always talk about like, oh, San Diego would be nice. So, you know, if I open somewhere near Philly or Jersey or Boston, right, where my wife's from, then I'm, I'm, I'm stuck there, right? You're limited. Other things that are cons are you're now like a business person. So you really have to like understand finances and all that management. Like there's so much more to worry about, especially if you're hiring other people. Um, but again, the pros, you're in control, you're your own boss. There's a lot more money to be made um, if you do it the right way. Um, <clears throat> you kind of get to choose the patients in, in, in a way. Um, there's no administrative like authority politics like you can see in a hospital. Um, and then there, there, there's just a lot more flexibility in private practice. You can choose what days you want to work. So it's kind of nice. What is your most interesting case in pm and <clears throat> In your opinion, what was your most uh, challenging class throughout med school? That's a good question. So let's talk about the first one. Most interesting case. So again, I'm kind of a newbie in pm and although my most interesting case was this 21-year-old uh, female came in with the uh, arterial venous malformation of the brain. So she was getting clonus of her foot. Like it just kept going like this and nobody could figure out why. The people thought it was stroke. People thought she was having a stroke. So essentially she came to the pm and clinic we made her walk and then we took note of her like social situation. She said she walks very fast. Sometimes she trips. She's very like, you know, almost like ADD. Like she talks like this and oh my God, she's very excitable. And so when you look at the whole picture, you're like, huh, let's have you walk. She walks very fast. And then we eventually saw that come on again when she was walking so fast. So I thought that was the coolest case because it wasn't necessarily clear cut and be like, oh, this is what it is based off science. It was a very social situation case. And that's why I love pm and is you really have to think outside the box and not only just look at the patient and the body, but also look, take a step back and say, how are they living their life? What are the things that they're doing that could contribute to their disease, right? So it's very holistic in that sense. And then, um, oh yeah, most challenging class. For me, it was neuroblock. Neurology, for some reason, I don't know. It was just tough. It was like, you know, I saw a meme and it's like, dude, why is Nero so hard? It's literally the brain teaching itself. And it's so true. But Nero, Nero's tough. It was tough for me. Um, it was very fast paced. That's why I fell behind on the first practical. I failed it. I got like a 52%. And so the rest of the block for the 12 weeks, I was so focused on not re remediating that class and staying an extra week for like summer school. So I was so focused on doing well that next anatomy practical that all my other classes took a hit. So that was just like a challenging, definitely challenging time and challenging block. Um, but neuro was tough. And what's funny is pm is heavy neuro. Um, so again, things that you learn are gonna be different than how you do it clinically. So, you know, I hated ob I hated learning reproductive system, but then when I actually did ob loved it. So it's, it's, it's very different. So don't rule out things just yet, right? Until you get to medical school. What was the hardest part about getting married and starting a new life with someone during medical school? So I got married, um, you know, like four months ago during residency. Me and my wife are doing long distance. Uh, I was, you know, Blacksburg, Virginia. She was in Boston. Um, so we were kind of like used to it. Toughest thing about getting married, I think, is now like starting residency, you really have to work more on balancing, right? Like sometimes you want to come home and sleep. Sometimes you want to come home and you want to study. Sometimes you want to come home and just like be alone. Um, but then also just like balancing, spending time with her, making sure you go on like dates and stuff and like just work, you know, adding another piece to the puzzle and figuring it out. So <clears throat> see, that can definitely be challenging. How has meditation helped you in managing studies and things you want to do extracurricularly? Yeah, so meditation, has given me a better perspective on life, right? So I have this poster that's called My Life in Weeks. And each week you color in the box and it goes up to hundred years old. And it's a visual representation of how much life you've lived and how much you have left, right? And I think so many of us get caught up in this whole doctor game. I need to be a doctor. I wanna be a doctor. I wanna to go to med school. I wanna do this, I wanna do that. That we forget that there are so many more important things than being defined as a doctor. Yes, it's amazing work. Yes, you, you want to achieve that. But as you're doing that journey, make sure you take a step back and live your life and enjoy it, right? You never know, never know what could happen, right? Now, like one of my favorite quotes from um, Marcus um, Aurelius in Meditations, one of his books, Stoic Philosophy is, you know, 
the, the only, there, there's a lot of differences between an 83 year old and like a two week old baby, but everything that's similar, the one thing that's similar is the present moment. And you can always take that away from someone. Um, you know, hearing those words or reading those words, like a lot of times has really instilled that in me to just realize like, you know, when, when things go bad in the hospital, when I'm having a crappy day or when I get chewed out by an attending, just, yeah, I can sulk in that for a moment, but don't let it eat me up. You know, just so, like, at least I'm alive. There's so many more important things that are going on. So many worse things that could happen that gratefully haven't happened. Right. So always just trying to keep that perspective. Um, that's what meditation has taught me. Um, and it's really allowed me to just kind of pursue things outside of just medicine. And it allows me to step outside the box instead of just boxing myself in into this medical field and this is it and this is this, just the black and white one way. And like I said in the beginning of the talk, one of my goals is to get you guys in that gray area of thinking so that, you know, that's where all the growth happens. So that is what meditation essentially has done for me. Um, how do you deal with burnout? What advice could you give college students that are losing motivation? Yeah, this is a great question. It's kind of related to what I was just saying. So you got to look at the end game, right? So chess master, there's this famous chess master. I can't, I can't, his name doesn't come to me right now. His favorite quote was, the details are in the end game. If you want to win a game of chess, you have to understand the end of it before you move your first pawn, right? Because you have to understand the checkmate. In life, it's the same thing. You have to understand your end game. What kind of life do you want to live, right? When, you, when you're on your deathbed, what do you want out of life? Right. I'm sure most people, including me and everyone is, I want like a happier, peaceful, um, life without not, with not many regrets, but it's funny because being a doctor is not in that, right? Being a doctor can help you get that life, but that isn't the definition of the end game. Right? So when I look at burnout and when I get burnt out as a physician, I remind myself, what am I getting burnt out from? I'm getting burnt out from a piece of the puzzle that's helping my end game. I'm not getting burnt out from the game itself. I'm not getting burnt out from a peaceful life. You know what I mean? So it just puts things into perspective. When you're losing motivation, what are you losing motivation from? You're losing motivation on one avenue of getting to a journey that's going to help you with your overall life, right? So if, if somebody told me, hey, Darsh, you can have the happiest life, be enlightened, do this Zen, be financially free, go travel the world. The only thing is you can't be a physician. Would I do it? Yes, I would do it right? Because my end game isn't necessarily being a physician. It's being a physician so I can make an impact, so I can enjoy my life, so I can be financially free, so I can, you know, put in more money to charity and all this stuff and help other people. But in the end, you have to realize what your end game is, right? And I think all of us want to make an impact. And that's very important. So keep that in mind when you're talking about motivation and stuff, right? What, what, what are you doing it for? It's for the impact. It's for the end game. It's for that life you want to live not necessarily just being a doctor. So I think that's, that's the one thing that really helps me with, with the burnout. Medical school, how did you deal with the rigorous coursework and what did you do on your free time when you needed a break? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I honestly tell people I was rarely stressed in med school. I was rarely like push it a bring because one, again, the way I sorted out my study schedule and never procrastinated, I always just kept with what it was. And then every day I would at least try to work on my, you know, passions or five days out of the seven week, continue to work out, continue to go out and have fun, continue to talk with family, continue to see my now wife, continue to meditate, continue to re continue to grow myself. Right. And when you're doing those things, you're not going to get pushed to the brink because every day you're going to look back and be like, I did what I needed to do, you know? And a lot of times we're not like, think about those times where you're like, I'm going to get a workout in today, but you don't do it yet you accomplish so many other things, it still bugs you, right? It's still like, man, but I didn't do that one thing. I didn't do the workout and I told myself I would do that this morning, right? So you just, I don't let that happen, right? And if I do, um, get on it the next day. You know, like you've got to make yourself a promise and commitment that that is the first thing I'm doing next day. Um, so it's just building a pattern of consistency. Uh, in medical school, how did you deal with the rigorous? Oh, I already asked that. How long is the residency of PMNR? Um, it is three years. So again, you're doing one year of an intern year, and then you're doing three years of PMNR. So a total of four years residency. And if you do a fellowship, most of them are one year long, except pediatric rehab. That's two years. But you could do a combined pediatric PMNR residency, which is five years altogether. Okay. 
Cool. So I think uh, I just went through all the questions. And again, if anybody has anything else, if anything comes to your mind, feel free to message me on Instagram. Um, it's at dr.darsh, doctor spelled out. Uh, Darsh is spelled D-A-R-S-H. Um, say hi and uh, I'll message you back. Yep, and we will put the um, his Instagram handle in the uh, chat for you guys to um, look at and use if you want to ask him any more questions. But thank you so much, Dr. Darsh. Um, that was a great Q&A session. And we learned a, a lot about um, just like medical school, going through residency and like all that advice was really great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on here again. I try to keep it as real as possible. And just like a quick tip too, whatever you guys see on Instagram, I think all of us are trying to make it as glamorous as possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, take everything with a grain of salt, you know? Yes, it's a great career. It's fun. There's so much goodness to it, but there's also times where it's just grueling, right? And that's the thing people don't want to really talk about, but it's important right. to ask and make sure that you understand that side too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. And um, for everyone still watching, make sure to go check out his um, Instagram page. It's really informative as well. So um, he does do a lot of uh, Instagram lives. So um, those are really informative. Uh, please go ahead and uh, check those out. But yeah, thank you so much for being on our shadowing session. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for